Okay, so let's now talk about uh, ADCs, digital to analog converters. Now, whatever we have talked about, the parameters, the terminology, the formulas, resolution spans, the ranges, the refs, uh, they are all valid. Uh, but this time we are inputting a voltage and that voltage uh, may be uh, inputted in after some conditioning in order to have a valid and not distorted voltage levels. So this voltage is then converted to some digital outputs and this voltage range that we convert has to do uh, with our VREF again. So it's still a valid assumption that the resolution here associated with the uh, uh, one uh, least significant bit change at the output uh, again related to our range. Um, so then we can calculate sometimes or some type of uh, quantization uh, errors when it comes to the analog to digital converters in terms of what is the voltage input and what is my big output. Now, what is my big output is actually corresponds, let's say, uh, to when I take my weighted bits and multiply my overall span or range, that quantization error is basically the error behind my analog to digital conversion. So how well I can convert analog signals to digital as we mentioned earlier, um, if you try to convert uh, analog uh, changes here uh, that is lower than this quantization error, then there is no way you'll be able to do it. So it's important to understand these resolutions and accuracies behind the analog to digital converters. Now, let's look at the example. Uh, so we have got an 8-bit analog to digital converter where we have got a reference voltage as five volt. Now that gives us some idea that our span, uh, we are not given any in negative reference, so we can just have VREF, which is five volts, and our span is in this case uh, five minus uh, zero, it's going to be five. So, we want to find out binary output codes uh, associated with input, which is 1.2 volts. Now, we have done a similar example, but there's another way of doing this. Now, you can think of this as I have 1.2 volts, right, as my input, and now uh, as my digital conversion, I will try to get as close to it as possible by identifying the bits. Uh, which are multiplied by each of their own weights and the whole thing multiplied by my range. So our goal uh, will be to minimize the quantization error, uh, basically absolute value of the difference between these two numbers. Now this is uh, really what we are trying to remember. Uh, this is how the circuit is operating and it's trying to minimize this error. And we are going to see how the analog to digital converter implements a sequencer, sequencer kind of uh, state machines uh, later on in order to do this minimization uh, of the quantization error. Now, if we focus on the minimization or minimizing, uh, uh, we identify the corresponding bits. Basically, we can manipulate this equation and we can see that um, 1.2 volts divided by five volts is actually giving us 0.24. So basically, uh, these ratings, when we add them up, we want to get as close as possible to this 0.24. So that, that corresponds to the combination of the uh, ratings. Now, if we look at the next setting, so we can see over here that 1.12, 1.2 minus 5 multiplied by the range over here with the weights. So we can have two options. Now, when you add these up, you can see that we are getting 0.23828125. 
and if you change the bits and you add them together you get 0.24 now which one would you choose now when you think about it uh, this one is actually smaller number so this should this is actually going to be the correct setting so therefore this setting which is close to the 0 0.24 is actually giving us 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, and then 128 is not here so it's 0 and then 256 it's going to be 1 so that's why we get this uh, D out which minimizes the error so that's the part A of this uh, question. In the part B, what is the voltage resolution step size corresponding to one least uh, significant P? Now, it's asking for the resolution and how do you find what is the resolution corresponding to one least significant bit? Now, we find that by taking our range and dividing it by our number of settings, right? To the power eight. So our range is, uh, we can say VREF, divided by to the power n, which is 5 over 256, which is 19.5 millivolts again. Okay, and if you want, like we have done it before, we can find the digital out by doing 1.2 minus 0 offset divided by 19.5 millivolts, and that will give you the digital value. Okay, so this was the previous uh, formula that we have used in order to find the digital value. And I just want to show you how we can uh, use this to minimize the error. Okay. So let's do another example. Now, linear sensor approximation. So when we consider the linear sensors, they are actually giving a linear relationship between the measurement and the voltage that they are uh, sending out. So, for example, minus 10 degrees in this case is equivalent to minus 22.5 volts. So, they are having a linear uh, relationship, okay, voltage against the measurements. So, slope M is and the C is the intercept, uh, with, and we can easily do the calculations and let's do the example if uh, assume a linear temperature sensor with measurement range is minus 10 degrees to 140 degrees okay so this is example four so minus 10 degrees is actually corresponds to minus 2.5 volts and 140 degrees it's, it corresponds to plus 5 volts. Now, if connected to an 8-bit AD analog to digital converter, find offset, span, step size, resolution in both voltage and decrease Celsius. Okay, so when we think about the span, is the range. Okay, so... The voltage side is 5 volts minus, minus 2.5. This will give you 7.5 volts. And when you think about the uh, decrease, 140 minus, minus 10 degrees, that's going to be 150 degrees. So step size or the resolution in this case it's going to be 7.5 volts divided by it's an 8-bit resolution 8-bit uh, analog to digital converter so 256 is the number that we are dividing so that's going to give us 29 millivolts okay and we we apply the same thing with the uh, decrease so 150 divided by 256 
this is decrease that will give us 0 0.59 decrease okay so 29 millivolts corresponds to 0 0.59 decrease that's our step size and resolution so we find the offset span offset is actually the uh, minus 2.5 and minus 10 decrease so this is the offset let's consider that as well we found the step span and step size so that's part i for this question and what is the digital output of the analog to digital converter if the temperature is plus 10 degrees so in that case what we can do is we can put this into an equation because we have got 5 volts and that's going to be slope multiplied by the measurement which is uh, 140 degrees plus C that is our first equation and then minus 2.5 volts and then slope multiplied by minus 10 degrees plus intercept so we have got two equations actually based on these uh, observations and when we solve these two equations i'm not going to do the maths over here so when solving one and two m is going to be 0 0.05 okay per decrease and c is going to be minus two volts so the linear relationship is v out is 0 0.05 times t minus 2 so voltage for 10 degrees we can easily find that out 0 0.05 times 10 degrees minus 2 volts it will give us 1.5 volts and the digital output then minus 1.5 minus minus 2.5 divided by 0 0.29 and that will give us 34.4, which is 34. In this case, we can say it's hex 22 as a digital output. So we can easily find out the uh, relationship between these when you have a linear approximation. Okay, so... If you do remember, uh, we introduced signal conditioning in slide 7. And we have said that we are going to use this uh, to uh, in the analog to digital converter input. However, for many reasons, uh, uh, you may need to pre-process these uh, analog inputs when you receive that from the sensor. So that's why we need some kind of uh, signal conditioning through some circuitry in order to do this and we need to do this uh, most ac in the most accurate way so uh, the signal circ uh, signal conditioning circuits may have uh, many elements depending on what type of transducers we are using or what type of sensors we are using sometimes it may need to be doing impedance matching sometimes it may need to do provide a low impedance low input impedance, sometimes high input impedance in order us to transfer the signal as best as possible to the analog to digital converter. And most of the time, what happens is these sensor signals we capture in this case, uh, the transistor is operating in sensor mode. A lot of times they are going to be small signals, very small signals. Uh, that they need to be amplified before the analog to digital converter can successfully converted to uh, now these signals typically get amplified so it's it's going to be within the range of the converter and this amplification process again ensures maximum accuracy that's why we need signal conditioning now as i already mentioned in many applications the sensors output signal is too small and to be accurately converted to uh, digital by analog to digital converter, signal conditioning, or maybe we call them voltage converter circuits, provide 
required amplification. And also isolation so that the sensor output does not get modified due to excessive loading. Okay. Now, the ideal conditioning circuits have high impedance input and low impedance output, like a differential amplifier that we have seen R to R ladder. Now, ideally, the common mode gain should be zero for differential amplification, and differential gain should be maximum. So, we are actually using a metric uh, to measure the performance of a differential amplifier. Uh, which we call it common mode rejection ratio, which is CMRR, and which should be maximized uh, when designing the differential amplifier circuits. Okay, I'm not going to go into the details of this, uh, which you have already seen in the circuit theory courses. So you, all you just need to do is that we have to do a signal conditioning uh, in order to have accurate uh, signal that can fit into the uh, analog to digital converters. Now, next thing that I want to consider is the sample and hold circuit. Now, what do we mean by sample and hold circuit or sample and hold function? Every analog to digital converter has uh, some type of sample and hold function. What this allows is uh, basically sample and analog voltage at any given point. Okay. So in this waveform, as you can see over here, these are our sampling points, let's say. And at this point, we sample voltage and we charge our capacitor. Now, this is our hold capacitor that basically holds the charge during the time our analog to digital converter is working at that particular voltage. Now, it's basically um, keeping the input of the analog to digital converter stable while the analog to digital converter is doing its job. Now, we can consider this circuit here as a part of pre-processing circuit or signal conditioning circuit. Okay, they, they, it's quite easy to understand that. Now, whenever we deal with this type of simple sampling with a switch, which is a quick on-off switch for the sampling, there may be some problems. What are those problems? So for example, once we charge this capacitor, the whole capacitor, the charge may leak away. Now, as long as this switch is closed, the charge may leak back to the source or the charge may leak in the analog to digital converter, like uh, we have mentioned in the R to R ladder structure okay so charge may go into the other direction so voltage uh, may be corrupted based on how these circuits are designed and typically uh, we would like to have high impedance at the input of the a to d converter meaning high input resistance such that we don't have a charge loss in that circuit as we are keeping our whole capacitor charged all the time so it's supplying the right signal to the ADC. So what do we need to do? Now, one way to eliminate or solve this problem is incorporating more circuitry. For example, uh, we might have more signal conditioning stage where once we monitor the signal, we may make a copy of it over here Okay, uh, we, are, we are sampling this copy, will done in high impedance, so this signal, signal is not going to change uh, due to getting monitored because of the input and amplifier uh, close to infinite impedance. So as we know, the current going into an amplifier in an ideal amplifier is equal to zero so that we can uh, keep our signal monitoring fairly intact. Now, this topology is called voltage uh, follower topology. Um, it is a negative feedback mode that basically copies input to the output. So we are making sure that V in minus equals to V in plus, as I already mentioned in the R to R structure. Now, by making a copy of the signal, we make sure that our signal is not uh, distorted or lost. And after our sample may come in, so when this switch is contacted in, 
At that point, we are actually transferring this signal to the capacitor. So we are actually again charging the whole capacitor. Now, we are charging the capacitor and then we open the sampling switch. This capacitor should keep the charge while ADC is working on the voltage that is sampled. And in order to make sure that we don't have any current going into the ADC or a lower current, we have an other voltage follower here, again, to make sure that we do not get a distorted signal into the ADC. So we can actually modify the circuit to have more signal conditioning to make sure that we don't lose the signal before it gets into the ADC. Okay, so another important element of the uh, analog to digital converters, uh, which is a sequencer or FSM, uh, this actually makes sure that the ADC goes through steps correctly in order to arrive at a digital output as fast as possible and that corresponds to the analog input. And one of the common algorithms to implement the sequencer is called successive approximation actually. And in successive approximation, uh, conversion time is maintained constant and is proportional to the number of bits in the digital outputs. The unknown analog input uh, voltage is approximated against n-bit digital value by trying uh, one bit at a time, beginning from the most significant bit. I'm going to show you an example in order to understand how this is going to work. Now, this type of analog to digital converters operates by successfully dividing the voltage range by half. Okay, And there are a few steps over here that we are going to see them uh, in a minute. So one thing that we need to be careful when we are doing this uh, successive approximation, C out is high if V in, maybe we should write that over here because we are going to do an example. C out is one if V in is greater than V out, or C out is zero if V in less than or equal to v out so this is the property that we need to take care so we are actually going to compare v in and uh, v out which is coming from the DAC. so you can see how DAC is incorporated in this successive approximation in our digital converters okay so here are the steps. So sample and hold circuit samples and stores the analog input, which is V in. And the logic starts by generating a mid-range digital value. So first guess to digital to analog converter. Let's say we have got a six bit A to D and the most significant bit is set to one. Now V out from D A to A is compared against V in at the comparator. Now, if V in is greater than V out, then C out is going to be one. So, which causes the logic to freeze most significant bit. So that most significant bit is not going to change. And generate a halfway signal between uh, VCC over two, and uh, then it moves to the next bit. Now, whenever if the, we get a V in less than or equal to V out, then C out is going to be zero, uh, which causes logic to freeze at zero and generate a voltage again between halfway VCC over two. Then we move to the next one. So the same process from two to uh, five, steps five, repeated. Uh, until we get to the least significant bit is process. So when approximation sequence is complete, the analog to digital control converter control enables the digital signal to the digital output. Okay, so let's see an example how this uh, successive approximation is uh, working. Now let's say we have got a six bit analog to digital converter where we have got V in as 4.16 volts. And the range, range is between 
0 to 5 volts. OK, so in this case, VREF is equals 5 minus 0, 5. And V out can be calculated as VREF multiplied by, as we have got uh, six bits starting from D5 plus D4, D3, D2, D1, D0. So these are all divided with the 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, and 64. Okay. Now, so this is the formula that we are going to use. And we know that we need to compare V in over V out. Okay, so 6 bit output. That means 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. That's 5, and that will be 6. OK, now the first bit is the most significant bit, which is D5 is set. So it's going to be, in this case, V out is going to be 5 times. Now D5 is going to be 2 to the power 5 is 32, divided by the common denominator is 64 for these. Okay, so this will give us 5 times 0 0.5, which is equivalent to 2.5. Now, is 4.16 greater than 2.5? Yes, that means then C out will be 1. So we have got the first most significant bit. We freeze it and C out becomes 1. Then we go for the second bit, which is uh, D4. Then we have got 1, 1, 0, 0, 0. Okay. So here we have got 5 we ref times. Now we have got... What do we have? We have got 32 plus 16, so 1, 1 over here, 60, uh, 48 divided by 64. So this will give us 3.75 volts. So 3.75, it's again less than V in, so that means C out is going to be 1 as well. Then we go for one 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 zero zero zero. So in this case, five times we have forty eight. Then this one will be one. So to the power three, which is eight. Then it's going to be fifty six divided by sixty four, which is going to give us four point three seven five. Now, 4.375 is larger than V in. That means C out is going to be 0. And that means 110 is set. And then we check the next bit. So 5 times, then this is going to be 48 plus 4, which is 52 divided by 64, which is going to give us 4.063. And then, again, V in is greater than this value, so it's going to be 1 as well. So this carries on like that. So this one set, then we go for the next one, and we check that one. 422, it's greater than V in, so it's going to be 0. Then the last one, it's going to be 4.14. So V in is greater than this one, so it's going to be 1. And this is how we can do the successive 
approximation. I hope it's all clear. Um, if you have questions, please note them down and feel free to ask them during the live session. So we can also have a discrete ADC components like we have got DAC. Uh, this is an example of it, uh, which is one of the most used ADC. It's an 8-bit ADC. You can find it on the market. Um, they have got the similar properties with the DACs and we are going to see uh, similar one in the AVR side, uh, which we are going to talk next. So I'm not going to give any more details over here or uh, how this is working. There are multiple channels that you can use and some output, write, uh, chip select, read and so on. And some configurations, which we are going to talk about these ADC types in the AVR section. And at Mega128 Analog Comparator, so one of the essential features of, uh, uh, of course, is the uh, analog subsystem in AVR, is the analog comparator. Now, analog comparator is very useful, of course, uh, as you have seen, as a part of analog to digital conversion. Now, whenever the analog to digital conversion is performed, it actually per, uh, compares something uh, is guessing and something that is inputting from a sensor or some maybe an external analog voltage. Now, this analog comparator can be used as a part of the analog digital system or it can be also be used as a standalone system. So it can be configured. This is uh, some of the features of the AVR. So, for example, Two external pins, PE2 and PE3, uh, of the AVR can fit uh, through this analog uh, multiplexers. We have got the multiplexers over here, uh, directly to its inputs of the uh, analog comparator. So we can easily compare two external voltages, and depending on which one is higher, we either get uh, zero or one from this comparator. And we can actually fit this zero or one into an interrupt, and we can easily generate an interrupt uh, based on which one is higher. And it's actually a great capability because this allows us to compare two external analog voltages and generate an interrupt depending on which one is higher. So, if we can give an example to it, we can say that, for example, we want to know whenever, uh, uh, let's say, I'm using a battery, uh, I am giving this as a sake of example. So whenever this battery discharges from its maximum, let's say uh, six volt down to four volts or maybe less, I want to know about it. So that means our battery is going to be discharged. So uh, we have to notify or monitor this. Now I can build an external circuit. For example, we can have a resistor divider. And I can say here, uh, something like that, we have got R and 2R and we are going doing a register divider over there. Maybe I can draw it. Okay, so that fits in. And we have got a six volt battery. That fits in as well. So that's our analog comparator over there. Okay. Now, what I can do is, as these are feeding into my analog comparator uh, input pins, and I can easily generate an interrupt whenever my charge falls below the formals. Right, so that's the way of saving, okay, whenever battery is empty, I want to generate an interact so that I can do something about it. Maybe I will shut down my system or maybe I can save my data and so on. So this is just an example of an application and we can use it uh, uh, by, uh, we can implement it by using a analog comparator. 
So we have got a um, analog comparator max enable in uh, SFI SFIOR uh, register. So in the IO register, there's an analog comparator. So max enable enables the corresponding max, and it has to be in the, uh, on in order to uh, let's say turn on this comparator so again it's also shared uh, by the analog to digital converter so we should only use it uh, in standalone manner whenever we are not using analog to digital converter and uh, it has got uh, many uh, configurations so like we can disable it we can select the band gap uh, comparator output interrupt flag interrupt enable and input capture and so on which uh, and uh, for example uh, the band gap is most stable uh, reference so we can generate internally as a voltage reference that does not change much so for example in a, our previous example instead of getting an external voltage to compare against we can let's say get uh, the internal band gap reference voltage generated inside uh, our chip and then we can use it compare against so that's another option and uh, we can basically have a comparator output with some delays we can generate interrupt we can look at whenever comparator is ready to report the result um, we can also use the analog comparator as an input capture mode so uh, allows the comparator trigger an input input capture event so remember those events can then go to a timer and we can actually time when this comparator is flipped its output coming back to band gap voltage reference, uh, band gap circuits. Band gap uh, voltage reference is available in Micah 128 and output is typically uh, 1.3, uh, 23 volts. And uh, the 2.56 volt uh, internal reference is generated from this uh, reference. Um, so they are generally used by the brownout detection circuitry and optionally by ADC or the comparators. Uh, it can only be enabled when one of the below is true. So either the Bowden fuse or the band gap reference is connected to analog comparator, as I mentioned, or, or when the ADC is enabled. So it takes around 70 microseconds to start up uh, and then it consumes 10 microamp uh, um, current for the consumption. Okay, so we have seen everything related with the analog to digital and digital to analog converters, all the properties, parameters, the structures and how they are working and now they are converting. Now, uh, we have to understand these in order to use these type of resources in AVR in embedded systems in order to program them or configure AVR to do some operations accordingly. And this is what we are going to see next.